vibration from Krishna's flute, which penetrated through the covering of the universe and reached to the spiritual sky. This is very wonderful. Of course, Krishna's flute is not an ordinary flute. Krishna's flute is like his creative energy. Uh, and by Krishna's flute, he, he can create so many things, anything he wants, actually. Uh, Krishna's flute is one of his major potencies. And uh, it's so bewildering because the music that he plays is so, so far out, you know, so complex. Uh, we read um, different descriptions in the scriptures. Like, for example, okay, in Vedic music, there are basically 12 notes. Uh, each raga has a, a, usually seven notes, and they're chosen from among these 12 notes. So you can have sharps and flats and like that. Uh, similar to Western music. But in Vedic music, there's also something called gana. Gana means that the raga is played from a different note than the sa. Uh, you hear Ravi Shankar and people like that doing this sometimes. And it sounds really far out. It's like modal, uh, where you know you have, you have a raga. Well, let's see. Hello? The volume. Oh, the vol oh volume's up now. No? Oh, there we go. OK, so let's say if we have a raga. Like raga shri. OK, that's, that's the normal way of playing the raga, right? But instead of starting on the, on the first note, sa, there's something called uh, pagama, where you start on pa instead. So you'd still keep the same drone, huh? But instead, you would start the, start the raga on sa. starts to sound far out. But you, that's not all. You not only can start it on sa, you, uh, sorry, on pa, you can also start it on ma. And this is called magama. See? And then there's even gagama where you start the, the mantra, or start the raga on ga. It's said that gagama is inconceivable by human beings. But Krishna not only plays in Gagama, he plays in all of the Gamas, all the rags and all the Gamas. And each one has a specific mood and a specific feeling and a, a particular application in his pastimes. Uh, so th for this reason, even the great demigods like Lord Brahma and Shiva find it very difficult to understand Krishna's music. Krishna's music is like far beyond. And then there, that's not all. <laughs> There are rhythm changes. And for example, I've heard uh, Indian musicians playing, and they'll be playing a certain rhythm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, like that. And then they'll start playing instead of with the same beat going, right? They'll start interpreting the rhythm as one, two, three, 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 one. Uh -huh. This is called, uh, technically uh, speaking, is called hemalia. 
at least in Western music. I don't know what it's called in rock. But they, they can sustain this, I mean, for like a whole long time. And each time when they come to the end of the ryth rhythmic cycle, they come back together with the drum. And the effect is like mind-blowing. It's like psychedelic, uh, these rhythm changes. No, really. You listen to it for a while and you're like, eh. <laughs> you know. So Krishna could do this, but he would do it with, with different time signatures that are like completely far out like seven and five, you know, and, you know, just mind-boggling. And, and even the demigods, they can't keep up with it. They're like, oh, this is too much. But for Krishna, it's like effortless. <laughs> yeah. Well, the gopis are very jealous of Krishna's flute. Huh? Krishna's flute gets to, gets to enjoy Krishna's kisses all the time. But they can only enjoy at night. In the daytime, they have to pretend like, oh, yes, Krishna's our friend, but nothing's going on. <laughs> so uh, the gopis are jealous of the flute. But Krishna's flute is he's in a very special position because he is a potency, creative potency of the Lord. And finally, number 64. You've waited all this time. Now here it comes. Krishna's exquisite beauty. In the third canto, second chapter, verse 12 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Uddhava tells Vidura, My dear sir, Krishna's form was most wonderful when he appeared on this planet and exhibited the potency of his internal energy. His wonderfully attractive form was present during his pastimes on this planet. And by his internal potency, he exhibited his opulences, which are striking to everyone. His personal beauty was so great that there was no necessity for his wearing ornaments on his body. In fact, instead of the ornaments beautifying Krishna, Krishna's beauty enhanced the ornaments. This is hard to imagine. But try to understand how beautiful Krishna is, that even when he wears valuable ornaments, oh, and Krishna, by the way, he has so many ornaments that he has a whole palace just to keep them at all. Uh, in Vrindavan, he had, right next to his home, he had a palace called the Ornament Palace. Oh, Sri Mati Radharani had one too. So when they would get dressed in the morning or in the evening for their pastimes, then their friends would decorate them with all these valuable ornaments. And these ornaments were so nice, they were so wonderful, that even Kuvera, the treasurer of the demigods, was envious that he didn't have such nice jewels and such nice ornaments. But yet, Krishna's body is so beautiful that even the ornaments were beautified by being placed on Krishna's body. So try to understand how wonderful uh, Krishna's bodily attractiveness is. Regarding the attractiveness of Krishna's bodily beauty and the sound vibration of his flute, in the 10th canto, 29th chapter, verse 40 of Srimad Bhagavatam, the gopis address Krishna as follows. Although our attitude toward you resembles loving affairs with a paramour, we cannot but wonder at how no woman can maintain her chastity upon hearing the vibration of your flute. And not only women, but even strong-hearted men are subject to falling down from their position at the sound of your flute. In fact, we have seen that in Vrindavan, even the cows, the deer, the birds, the trees, everyone has been enchanted by the sweet vibration of your flute and the fascinating beauty of your person. So Krishna is so attractive. Uh -huh. Everyone is universally attracted to Krishna. To see Krishna's form means you, you don't ever want to see anything else again. Krishna's form is so beautiful. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, the personality of Godhead in general is very beautiful. 
but Krishna's form in particular is so wonderfully beautiful, so unprecedented in its beauty, that his, his beauty uh, becomes indelibly stamped on the mind of the devotee. Uh, and whether one is male, female, animal, vegetable, mineral, it <laughs> doesn't matter. They're all attracted to this wonderful beauty of Krishna. In Rupa Goswami's Lalita Madhava, it is said, one day Krishna happened to see the shadow of his beautiful form reflected on the jeweled foreground. In, in Vrindavan, the devotees built a special uh, like a uh, little palace or little, it's kind of like, what do they call those things? They put them, you put them in a garden? Huh? A perga. A perga? 